All right, good afternoon. Uh, and I'll start off with my usual friendly uh, reminder to please mute your microphones and make sure you're sending both video and audio if you want to speak. Otherwise, it will not work. Um, today, the Security Council held an open video conference on the protection of civilians from conflict-induced hunger. This was the first time since the council began working remotely due to the virus outbreak that their statements have been uh, fully webcast. The executive director of the World Food Program, David v Beasley, in his intervention, warned council members that at the same time that we are dealing with a COVID-19 pandemic, we're also on the brink of a hunger pandemic. He noted that during his conversations with world leaders over the past months before the virus became an issue, he has been saying that this year we would be facing the worst humanitarian crisis since the Second World War for a number of reasons. Mr. Beasley stressed that we are not only facing a global health pandemic, but also a global humanitarian catastrophe, with 821 million people going to bed chronically hungry every night all over the world. Also speaking was the Director General of the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, Hu jong Yu. He reiterated in his address that conflict prevention and early action to reduce the impact of the conflicts are highly effective steps that can be taken to avert and reduce acute food insecurity. Also speaking was the Secretary General of the Norwegian Refuge, Refugee Council, Jan Eglund. <clears throat> And staying on the issue of food security, uh, an international alliance of United Nations, governmental and non-governmental agencies working to address the root causes of extreme hunger, today released the annual global report on food crises. The Secretary General, uh, in his foreword to the report, said that this year's report highlights the plight of millions of people who must fight every day against acute hunger and malnutrition. He noted the report also points to the way towards solutions that can rebuild lives and livelihoods in communities around the world. The report indicates that at the end of 2019, 135 million people across 55 countries and territories experienced acute food insecurity. Additionally, 75 million children had stunted growth and 17 million suffered from wasting in 2019. This is the highest level of acute food insecurity and malnutrition documented since the first edition of the report in 2017. The drivers behind these trends were conflict, weather, and uh, extreme weather, and economic turbulence. You can find the full global report on uh, food crises on the web. And um, we often, you know, we often mention in these briefings that our WHO colleagues or in the front lines trying to help the most vulnerable people. And I'm saddened to report that a driver with the World Health Organization working in Rakhine State in Myanmar died following a security incident yesterday while he was traveling in a clearly marked UN vehicle. Pia Song, uh, Pia Song Win Mong was transporting COVID-19 surveillance samples in support of the Ministry of Health. The head of WHO, Dr. Tedros, said it was tragic to lose a life while keeping the world safe. And I do expect a statement from the Secretary General a bit later on this issue. <clears throat> a few updates from our field missions now. Um, in uh, Libya, the UN mission there is extremely concerned about the deteriorating humanitarian situation in Tripoli and its surrounding areas as a result of the intensification of fighting in the past few days. At least 28 civilians were injured and five killed, including women and children, due to the dramatic increase of indiscriminate shelling on civilian populated areas. The mission in Libya is also alarmed by the deteriorating humanitarian situation in Tarhuna due to the military escalation in and around the city. And that has resulted in fresh displacement of civilians. The dire humanitarian situation is further exasperated by the continued electricity cuts in what is an apparent collective punishment for the people of the city in retaliation against cutting off of the gas supply to the Combs and Misrata power station. The mission calls on all parties involved to immediately end these electricity cuts 
and restore the flow of gas immediately. The UN, our colleagues on the ground, remind all parties to the conflict that indiscriminate attacks, as well as the targeting of hospitals and other medical facilities, and intentionally cutting off electricity, fuel, water, or food supplies, are violations of international humanitarian law and could, depend on the circumstances, amount to war crimes. And in Syria, uh, we are continuing to step up our cross border uh, response efforts out of Turkey into the northwest part of the country. This is to address the needs of 2.8 million people, including hundreds of thousands of people displaced since December 1st. In March, over 1,480 trucks carrying food, shelter, material, water, sanitation, hygiene, and nutrition assistance were sent into northwest Syria through the Bab al Hawa and the Bab al Salam border crossings. These are authorized by the Security Council. This is the largest number of trucks sent in a single month since the cross-border operations began in 2014. The pace of deliveries continues to increase in April. The first week alone, over 300 trucks crossed into northwest Syria. And this is monitored by the UN monitoring mechanism to ensure that the humanitarian nature of the, del of the deliveries. The deliveries are continuing daily and 55 more trucks cross today setting the pace for another record aid delivery month. And despite the delivery needs, uh, despite these deliveries, the needs remain incredibly high due to the mass displacement caused by intense hostilities earlier this year. In addition, there are significant concerns about a further increase in the need due to COVID-19. And turning to Yemen, General Hajid Guha, the head of the UN support mission of the Hudeda agreements, reiterated his condolences for the passing of Colonel Mohammed al-Sulihi of the government of Yemen. Colonel, Colonel al-Sulihi's service as a field liaison officer along the front lines of Hudaydah city will always be valued by the United Nations. <clears throat> General Guha is well aware of the government of Yemen's concerns and intends to discuss further with, it, with its redeployment coordination committee team on the best way to address those concerns. Despite the challenges presented by the coronavirus pandemic, the UN mission will continue to work on creating a conducive environment for the resumption of the work of the RCC. General Guha counts on the commitment of both parties to move forward with the implementation of the Hudeda Agreement. Meanwhile, uh, heavy rains and flooding across the northern governorates of Yemen, including Marib, in mid-April have led to, to casualties and damaged property and uh, damaged property and sites for internally displaced people. Uh, by April 18th, across Marib Governorate, nearly 6,290 families have been affected by the torrential rains and flooding that started on April 15th. Humanitarian partners are assessing the needs of affected families and damage caused. Some local NGOs have already provided urgent assistance, including food assistance, and over 500 families are accommodated in hotels in Marib City itself. <clears throat> and uh, some more, uh, I want to share with you some more uh, updates from around the world of the UN's uh, work in Bangladesh. The UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, today warned of life threatening consequences if annual monsoon preparations cannot be completed in time during this pandemic. This year's preparations have been impacted by the suspension of disaster risk reduction efforts, and the lockdown has also made deliveries of supplies very challenging. While it is vital to prioritize public health-related preparations in the uh, refugee camps, notably in Cox's Bazaar, cyclones and monsoon preparedness activities must also continue. The UNHCR stressed. Both done together will ensure that refugees have safe and sanitary living conditions in addition to potentially public health emergency. And in Togo, even before the first case was confirmed in early March, uh, our country team has been had been supporting the government with its preparedness plans to address the uh, health needs and the impact on livelihoods. Togo currently has 83 confirmed cases and the UN team there has sent dozens of experts, including epidemiologists, medical doctors, and others, to work directly with the Ministry of Health 
in areas including case management and the monitoring and tracking of contacts. The UN team is buying personal uh, protection equipment, testing equipment, respiratory kits, medicalized ambulances, and mobile clinics to reach remote communities. For its part, the UN Population Fund has donated delivery kits to improve pregnant women's access to medical services. UNAIDS is helping to ensure access to medication for people with chronic health conditions. The resident coordinator there, Damien Mama, is holding consultations with international partners to support the national response to the pandemic. And in Guyana, where there have been 63 confirmed cases of the virus, uh, the UN team on the ground has been supporting authorities in the areas of health, economic recovery, human rights, and logistics, among others. The Pan American Health Organization is providing training and test kits and is training government staff on risk communications and on checking the health conditions of those arriving in the country. Together with the UN Refugee Agency, it's also provided personnel protective, personal protective equipment. UNHCR is offering nearly 50 pre-manufactured housing units to serve as health facilities. The resident coordinator there, Mikiko Tanaka, is working with UN entities to provide social protection to the most vulnerable to prevent them from sliding into poverty, while the UN Population Fund is helping the government integrate gender-based violence and prevention into the response plan. Also, the International Organization for Migration and UNHCR are distributing food, hygiene, and other supplies to more than 4,000 migrants and refugees who have come in from Venezuela into Guyana. And the crisis, uh, this uh, ongoing virus crisis, is having devastating effect on workers and employers in all sectors. That's according to the information released today by the International Labor Organization, Workers in essential service areas, such as health and frontline emergency response, are at high risk of infection. Grocery workers, flight attendants, and auto workers are among those who've seen both their health and livelihoods threatened by the pandemic. In all these affected uh, sectors, the ILO has urged governments to extend social protection to all and is advising on measures to promote employment, retention, short-time work, paid leave, and other subsidies. The aim is to ensure that economics, the, the econo economies, labor markets, and industries will become more resilient and more sustainable when the pandemic resides. And today, the Secretary General Special Envoy on Disability and Accessibility, Professor Maria Soledad Cisternas Reyes, and the UN's independent expert on the enjoyment of all human rights by older persons, Rosa Kornfeld Mate, released a joint statement calling for the right of all persons infected with the virus to have access to intensive care units, including life-saving support. They emphasize that this includes persons with disabilities as well as older persons, and added they must be treated on an equal basis and that no national regulation should refuse them these services. The uh, two added that refusal may be classified as cruel and inhuman treatment and therefore a violation of their human rights. Their full statement is online. And uh, finally, I finally get to end with some good news. There are three new uh, full payments to the regular budget, and we thank our good friends in Barbados, Ethiopia, and the United Kingdom. Uh, these three now take us to 84 fully paid up member states. All right, we now move uh, to the call-in part of this show, and let's see um, what we have, for which I need my glasses. Uh, Edie? Who has more credibility with those, those oh, crucial... Thank hold you on very a second. much. Uh, Edie, hold on. There we go. I was needed to shut down my news. Edie, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Steph. Um, I have a Yemen question. Um, mm -hmm. There was a report today of a significant increase in civilian casualties in Yemen from both sides um, during April so far. And I wonder if you can give us an update on what Mr. Griffiths is trying to do to achieve a ceasefire. Well, we, we've all noted uh, the continued uh, violence. What Mr. Griffiths is doing is trying to get 
uh, the parties uh, to agree uh, to a nationwide uh, ceasefire, a sustainable nationwide ceasefire. Those discussions are ongoing, obviously in challenging circumstances, um, but that's that's what he's trying to do. And I think he was very uh, clear in his aim when he briefed the Security Council on that um, on that front. Uh, I will go uh, with a <clears throat> email question from uh, Richard Roth, uh, who asks, "What is the current presence of related uh, agencies, UN related agencies, in North uh, the, the, in the DPRK? Have they reported any sign of health crisis for Kim Jong Un?" No, we've. Uh, like you, we have seen the press reports, but we don't have any uh, information to share, or we don't have any information, frankly. Um, and uh, we still have a, a UN uh, humanitarian uh, presence and a country team in the DPRK. What is the current, you're also, uh, Richard, <coughs> excuse me, also asked, what is the current UN staff infection levels in NYC and around the world? Um, I will tell you that because I actually have that information. Um, in, um, uh, as of the evening of 19 April, Sunday evening, there were 243 confirmed cases among the UN, uh, worldwide, uh, 53 in the U S, uh, and uh, 32, uh, in, uh, in New York. Um, okay. Uh, Mr. Abadi. All right. I think uh, Mr. Abadi sent in his question, which is unemployment is spreading in the developing world. What is the ILO saying about the situation? Uh, I think I just flagged some of the ILO's uh, concern, uh, and I think I would refer you to uh, to the ILO for uh, for more information. They have a lot of information up on their uh, website. Iftikhar Ali of the Associated Press of Pakistan asks, does the Secretary General have any comments on President Trump's move to suspend all immigration to the U.S.? Uh, the answer is no. We saw the tweet uh, overnight, but I have no particular comment. Uh, Abdel Hamid and then Benny. Abdel Hamid. Thank you, Steph. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, normally, uh, Stefan, when we ask a question about Israeli plan to do something you normally say we don't comment on intentions but here there is an Israeli new government which had been formed yesterday between Likud and uh, la, la, between Likud and the uh, Lavon, Lavan, Lavan Kahol or between Netanyahu and Gantz and they put in writing that as of July 1st, they will extend Israeli sovereignty over Palestinian land in the West Bank. They didn't specify which, but it was part of the agreement. So is there a concrete position on this? Um, you know, I think we, we have uh, Mr. Mladenov, and we've said it in the past, uh, our concern about any movement towards uh, unilateral uh, moves or annexation and so forth. Um, that has been said in the past and that position uh, remains unchanged. And um, Mr. Uh, Mladenov will be briefing the Security Council uh, this uh, this week. Uh, Benny. Yes, actually, Richard Roth took my question about North Korea, but um, does the Secretary General or anybody at the UN system have any assessment on the effect of uh, the oil prices drop in the world on, on world economy, on world, on the crisis, on anything of that nature? Well, look, uh, we're, 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 not, uh, we're not market commentators, but I, I think what, is, what, what we're seeing with the oil uh, and the economy worldwide is is of concern uh, to the Secretary General, uh, notably how it impacts the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable uh, nations, and the instability that it brings uh, that it brings with it. And that's why I think there's a lot of thought being given and work being done on how how to rebuild better uh, the economies when we get to the other side of this to have more inclusive <coughs> more inclusive economies. Uh, more stable economies uh, and where we, we can 
refocus our work on the sustainable development goals and on tackling climate change, among others. Um, the Dulce has a question. Uh, Dulce, Dulce, how many deaths among UN personnel from COVID? Uh, uh, right now, there are uh, three fatalities that have been reported to us uh, throughout the UN uh, system. Um, and I would say, just to, to specify, because I gave the numbers earlier, those numbers are as valid as of April 20th, not April uh, 19th. Um, okay, uh, from Toby, DPRK report was finally published today. Does the issue have a comment on how DPRK has been getting around sanctions? Anything specific to that country? I, I think the, the Secretary General's message is, is clear uh, to all countries that are under sanctions from the Security Council uh, and those uh, member states is that the Security Council regulation sanctions need to be uh, need to be respected. Um, all right, uh, I think I've gone to the end of my uh, of my list. Uh, if our host Florencia will give me the all clear, I will leave you. Otherwise, I will wait. Okay, going once, uh, going twice. Uh, I was about to wish you a happy weekend, but unfortunately, it's only Tuesday. So, uh, though I look forward to seeing you uh, all tomorrow. Thank you.